Good evening and welcome. Before we begin tonight, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Otam and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Good evening again, and welcome. My name is Alain Philippe Durand, and I'm the Dorrance Dean of the College of Humanities at the University of Arizona. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Sorry about, uh, it's a little chilly tonight, but uh, you know, it's gonna be good. We celebrate National Arts and Humanities Month every October with the Tucson Humanities Festival, which is now in its 14th year uh, this year. The theme for this year's festival is style. This event started small as Humanities Week and through community outreach, engagement, and incredible speakers has grown into a month-long series of thought-provoking presentations. We would like to thank our sponsors who helped make tonight's event and the festival possible. KXCI Community Radio, the Center for East Asian Studies, uh, Arizona Humanities, the Council for Humanities, Bookman's Entertainment Exchange, and the Fearless Inquiries Project. Thank you so much. <clears throat> tonight's talk and the art in installation are part of a two-week series of activities featuring Fabiana Rodriguez, recipient of the Dorans Dean's Award for Scholar Specialist in Residence. Please make sure to stay for a reception following the talk tonight. Introducing Fabiana will be Assistant Professor of Public and Applied Humanities, Aris Kornstein, who along with fellow professors Jacqueline Barrios and Jonathan uh, Jane Chris Kreisman, submitted the Scholar in Residence application and organized Faviana's visit as part of the Fearless Inquiries project. Please join me in welcoming Aris to introduce Faviana. Thank you, Dean Durand, for your introduction and all of the work that you do to promote the power of the humanities to change the world, which we'll certainly see in action tonight. Uh, again, my name is Harris Kornstein, and it is truly an honor to introduce Fabiana Rodriguez. I first encountered Rodriguez when I myself was an undergraduate student almost 20 years ago when she gave a presentation at my college. As such, it is a joy to be able to bring her here to the University of Arizona to introduce her to our students. Back then, I was immediately captivated by not only her energy and talent, but her clarity of vision. As an artist and cultural strategist, her work has always been grounded in a vision of racial and social justice that balances the discipline of intersectional political struggle with the insistence that both our present and future make room for pleasure and joy. Following that presentation, I had the privilege of working with Rodriguez. Fellow students and I commissioned her to create artwork for our Intercultural Center's awards ceremony. The piece she sent, which you can see here, depicted three femmes symbolizing a spirit of vision, power, and action, 
with the title Indestructible. I could not think of a better example of the spirit of Rodriguez's entire approach to art making and cultural strategy, rooted in the collective confidence of our convictions and an unwavering belief in the power of culture, creativity, and community. This piece is also, as she might say, vintage Favi, offering a milestone to note the many directions in which her work has evolved over the years. One of the things that has struck me most in revisiting some of her early work is just how much her art practice represents a clear vocabulary and grammar, indeed a poetics. That is, while specific visual elements of her work have shifted over the years, there is an indelible mark that is instantly recognizable and has circulated extensively across so many domains. As I've shared information about this residency, so many friends and colleagues have responded with examples of her artistry that adorns their own classrooms, offices, meeting spaces, and homes, not to mention gallery walls, book covers, billboards, screens big and small, clothing, and even a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. It should go without saying that to see Rodriguez's work on any project is an incredible endorsement of its values of inclusion and imagination. Equally important, I want to highlight Rodriguez's generosity in sharing her work, of bringing in communities and ensuring that artistry is not merely, merely decorative, but integral to movements for social change. To that end, it is important to note that she is a serial entrepreneur, having founded a range of collective projects, including the Center for Cultural Power, for which she now serves as president. Over the past week, I have also been reminded of her deep spirit of collaboration as I have watched her welcome, welcome in and mentor our students, uh, including two who spoke earlier tonight, as well as community leaders with the same openness that she showed me when I nervously emailed her as a student myself hoping to work together. Here, I also want to emphasize that while we are proud to showcase Rodriguez's work at the Tucson Humanities Festival, as uh, Dean Durand mentioned, her time as the inaugural recipient of the Doran Steens Award for Scholar Specialist in Residence has extended far beyond tonight's presentation. As you may have noticed from the slideshows playing as you arrived, she has been here for quite a busy week, working with students in public and applied humanities classes to install Desert Symphony here, holding a conversation on creative entrepreneurship in the city of South Tucson, and leading a cyanotype workshop, workshop at Tumamock Hill. Uh, and there's one more workshop on Thursday, which is technically full, but I recommend signing up for the wait list because we'll probably let a few more folks in. Uh, throughout each of these gatherings, I have been truly blown away by the way in which Rodriguez literally lends her images for others to use in their own practice in a spirit of synergy that extends everyone's talents. To that end, uh, in addition to Dean Duran's thank yous, I would also like to thank some of our partners across this residency, including the Department of Public and Applied Humanities, the University Office of Hispanic Serving Institutions Initiatives, the Arizona Institute for Resilience, the Museum of Contemporary Art Tucson, the City of South Tucson, and last but certainly not least, Lina, uh, Luna Isol Cafe, which is the vision of the incredible Selena Barajas. Let's give a round of applause to all them. Um, and I would also like to offer a huge thanks to my partner in organizing this entire series, Dr. Jacqueline Barrios, who, like Rodriguez, is always boldly generous in her work and relationships. Um, again, I also just wanted to point out that we have created a commemorative sticker for this event, which is available at the welcome table over there. Um, so please make sure to take part of this installation home with you. Uh, and I also just want to say that we'll be um, holding a Q&A uh, where you can write your questions on index cards, so we'll come around with those towards the end of the talk. Um, finally, while we could be here all night, just let me share a few uh, of Rodriguez's formal accomplishments. Her work has been exhibited worldwide at leading institutions like the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Smithsonian, and the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. She has inspired audiences around the world through presentations at venues like the United Nations Climate Summit, Sundance Film Festival, and Google. And she is the recipient of many awards, including the Robert Rauschenberg Artists as Activist Fellowship, an Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity, and the Soros Equality Fellowship. And just this week, October 21st, was officially proclaimed as Faviana Rodriguez Day in the city of South Tucson. 
And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the inaugural recipient of the College of Humanities Doran Steens Award for Scholar, Specialist, in Residence, the truly indestructible Faviana Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I am uh, delighted to be here and really delighted to share with you my work as an artist and an activist and to share with you the power of culture, the power of art to transform our imagination and to speak to our hearts and minds. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the story, right? The power of our stories, of our individual stories, of our collective stories, but also how we can leverage our stories to change the world. I grew up in Oakland, California. My parents are from Peru. I'm the first generation that was able to go to college. And I grew up in Oakland during the era of the war on drugs. And Oakland used to be considered one of the homicide capitals in this country. It was deeply, deeply plagued with drugs, with gang violence. And so I remember looking out my window and just thinking like, wow, I feel like my neighborhood is so disenfranchised and neglected. And around the same time something was happening, it was the 80s, and hip hop was being born, right? And I remember the murals and the walls and people dancing, and I knew immediately that art and culture was a way that we could see a light at the end of the tunnel. That despite all the hardship, there was also stories of resilience. And I also grew up um, in, the, in the era following the Black Panthers, the Black Panthers from Oakland, California, so I grew up always in a very political culture, right? In a culture where we spoke out against the war, where we spoke out for gender equality, where we had folks like Harvey Milk, right? One of the first gay city council members in the country. And that shaped me as well. And, you know, being the daughter of an immig immigrant parents, my parents did not want me to be an artist. They wanted me to be a lawyer or an engineer. And so I could actually never take art classes in high school because I was too busy taking calculus and AP English and all of these things so I could get a full ride to college. I ended up going to UC Berkeley. Um, and you know, one of the things that I always talk about is I think that culturally sometimes we see the arts as something nice or the humanities as something cute. But in reality, art and culture is the power to shape our imagination. And we absolutely need art and culture as human beings we have been creating art around the fire. We've been telling each other stories. We are wired for stories. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Some of the artists that have most influenced me have been James Baldwin, Nina Simone, Victor Jara from Chile, right? Artists who spoke out. Artists who sang songs that continue to be with us today, right? Think about Nina Simone. Something that a lot of people don't know about Nina Simone is that Nina Simone died very poor. Nina Simone died without health insurance. And what I realized as an artist that followed the civil rights generation is that I wanted to build real power for artists because as artists, we are doing a lot of powerful work and yet we don't have infrastructure to be able to take care of us as we grow old, right? And so my mentors and the people that taught me taught me about the stories of artists. And at the basis of my work today is the idea that culture is power, that stories shape us and they shape everything in terms of how we relate, how we relate to each other, how we relate to the natural world. And so we can't leave culture on the table. And when we're talking about stories, I want to start with a core story, right? We have to start with with the, the, the story of how it is, of where we're standing today, what happened on these lands. And what happened on these lands was that th there was stolen land, right? Land was stolen from indigenous people. Indigenous people were practically wiped out of this continent. And you know, when I talk about climate change, climate change began with a disruption of ecosystems that started here over 500 years ago. And what happened after you had the devastation of native people all along this hemisphere is that you also had slavery, right? You had another, a, another group of people stolen from Africa and brought here. 
And we have to remember this because today, as we demand racial justice and as we're looking at climate crisis, we have to remember that this is the core story. And there are forces today that want to erase this story, right? You know, there is literally fights, again, cr against critical race theory. And I, I want to stress this because stories are important. Stories matter. They actually, when young people learn about this in high school, they get politicized and they say, I want to do something about it. I want to fight for equity. And so if we can understand that today in our country, there is people literally fighting this narrative, it gives you a sense of why culture and stories are powerful. I want to go back to my story because I want to tell you about how it is that I became involved in caring about the environment. What it is that, that, that happened to me. So I remember when I was a kid, everyone in my neighborhood had asthma. And I was born in 1978, right? Right before the 80s. And the 80s was a wild time. In 1970, something happened in my neighborhood, which is that you can sort of see it here. There's two freeways. Right? Those two freeways would carry goods from the Oakland airport to the port of Oakland. Now remember, I'm in California. California is the fourth largest economy in the world. There's a lot of goods being transported. So the folks that live up there in that freeway, they were mostly affluent, rich, white residents. And they said, we don't want trucks going through our neighborhood because these trucks, they spew emissions they release something dirty. So they banned trucks in 1970, and as a result, the trucks that go through my neighborhood, people have a disproportionate amount of pollution. In fact, if you could see, in some areas it's red. And this is by California standards, right? So I grew up in a place where I had no control over the air I breathe. And today, 45 years later, this is still the reality, right? There's places in Oakland that are considered have, have very high rates of cancer. And when I understood this, I realized that I needed to fight against, this is environmental racism, that I wanted to have a voice in changing and moving towards climate solutions. Because today, we are facing climate change, and climate change is caused by what? Fossil fuels, the burning of oils. The burning of oil that creates these emissions is caused by fossil fuels, it's caused by oil. And that is what got me engaged in climate justice. Now, uh, earlier I was talking about Tucson and why it's so important to me. Well, you know, I, the daughter of immigrants, I remember in 1994 in California, I don't know if any of you remember this, we had a governor named Pete Wilson. And Pete Wilson really hated that Latinos were, were in California. You know, the Latinos were growing and growing. It was the 90s. The census had come out, and it said Latinos are going to boom in California. So Pete Wilson created a whole narrative, a whole story, about how immigrants were coming in through the border and taking jobs. And you would see advertisements and commercials on TV that said these, I don't want to use the I word, these I immigrants, I don't want to use that word because it's a dehumanizing word, right? These I immigrants are coming in, and they're taking your jobs, and they're also on welfare, which is actually the complete opposite thing, right? How could somebody be taking your jobs and also be on welfare? It actually just makes no sense. But this was the narrative that was normalized, and thus began a very anti-Latino wave of anti-immigrant legislation. Because before that, the states would not do immigrant policies, right? That was federal policies. Well, it started in California. And when I saw that, I realized, like, wow, you know, my parents, they're hard workers. My, my parents worked two or three jobs. My family members who immigrated were always working. And I realized that people who had the power to shape narrative also had the power to shape laws. That was 1994. You know what happened here in Arizona in 2011? Can you all remember? SB 1070. Okay, California led the way. And over a decade today, Today, you all, we are, does anyone know how long it's been since we've had federal immigration reform to legalize immigrants? Anyone remember when the last time it was passed? 1986, 1986, and we have over 11 million people 
without a pathway to citizenship, who are extremely vital and core to our communities. And you know what happened is there was a narrative that we can't shake. And that narrative taught us to not care about immigrants. And these are immigrants who are picking your food and your vegetable, who are being exposed to pesticides. They're immigrants in the slaughterhouses, right? When COVID happened, who died? Who died first? It was immigrants. And so in 2011, when SB 1070 happened here, my friend Zach de la Rocha from Rage Against the Machine said, we're going to boycott Arizona. And he called a lot of us and he said, we have to boycott Arizona because we as artists need to do something. And I remember he called Lady Gaga and we all said, okay, we're going to Arizona because we need to go support our people there, right? There was people who were making signs, they were protesting. It was a hard time in 2011. I remember like it was, it felt very demoralizing to have those kinds of laws that were being passed here. And also Arpaio, wow, right? P keeping immigrants in, in tent cities, like that is, I know that that seems normal, that is not normal. That's not at all normal, and that's not how we should treat, how, how the richest country in the world should not treat immigrants in that way. We don't need to be putting mothers in, in, in cages with their kids for crossing into a better life when the United States actually had a lot to do with why people are so poor in, in Mexico, right? So I came to Tucson and I fell in love with Tucson and I met so many people here who were showing me what was really happening. Um, a woman named Isabel Garcia took us to uh, Operation Streamline, which was when you would go to the courthouses and 60 to 70 immigrants at one time with chains on their feet would get tried. Does anyone know Operation Streamline? That happened here. We would see it in the Tucson courthouses. And so I decided that we needed to bring all the artists here. And I brought a delegation of 60 artists. And some of these folks today are like world famous. Like my friend right there, Kamau Bell, who's going like that. Do you guys recognize him from the CNN show, United States of America, right? We brought artists, comedian, writers to, to see the border for themselves. And that was the beginning of my organization. My organization started with $60,000 Today, my organization is over six, $16 million, and we are now moving money to artists, right? And so I want to say this because I think sometimes we think, oh, artists, you guys are, you know, you're, you're doing cool work. We as artists, we can do groundbreaking change work because, again, stories shape policies. And if we're not working on the story, then we are not going to win on policies that help bring about change um, in our community. And so at my organization today, one thing we talk about is that culture changes worldview, right? And I'm talking about how you see the world. And so in my worldview, I don't think we need to be drilling into the ground to get oil that's 500 years old that is going to burn our planet. We don't need to do that. We have the sun, we have solar power. Right? In my worldview, I believe that all human beings can thrive in harmony with nature. I don't think we should dominate or extract from nature. I think that that model is no longer working for us. It's very clear. The UN has sounded an alarm. We have to shift. And so culture allows for us to change worldview. And I'm going to explain to you how it works. Because I want to show you this so that you all understand that what you're watching what you're listening to, what you're seeing in the magazines is shaping your imagination, okay? So what do I mean by culture? I mean music, food, games, your iPhone, social media, performance, dance, what you're reading, all of that shapes your imagination, okay? And think about what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. It's very important because when we, and I'm going to show you some examples. A lot of times, you know, when I was, I remember when I was, um, when I was a kid, there was no cartoons with Latinos in them. Okay, seriously. There was, I was like, okay, where are the brown little girls? I mean, Dora the Explorer came out. I was already an, an adult by the time Dora came out, 
right? I remember when I saw Selena, okay, for the first time, I was like, wow, who is this person? How am I seeing a Latina on TV, on the big screen? You know that today, Latinos make up about 19% of the United States. We have less than 3% visibility on television. That affects us. That affects laws that get passed, right? And so we have to understand that culture is a very, very powerful place because it affects your imagination, right? So imagine if on TV, you could turn on the TV and on your favorite show, like your favorite show, throw out some of your favorite shows that you guys like watching. It's okay, don't be shy. Friends. <laughs> huh? Friends. Friends. Okay, imagine you turn on Friends and someone's opening the curtain and says, oh, darn, there's a wildfire today. Shoot, we're not gonna be able to go out. Do you guys see the climate crisis in your favorite shows? No. It's a shame. It's a shame because we are in a climate crisis. <laughs> like, I'm just like, why are we not showing the reality so that people can be moved to action, right? We, we have to show that. Same thing, do you see disabled people in your favorite shows, right? Disabled people are, are, are everywhere. They, we, are, we are connected. Why, why are they so invisibilized, right? So we have to, and then Native Americans, you guys, Native Americans are less than 1% on everything that we see. Think about the books that you're, you're reading to your kids. Are they showing a diverse group of characters so that, our children are gonna grow up knowing that we live in a multiracial society with people of different abilities, right? And so if we are not shaping culture, we're not shaping politics. So there's three realms of change, culture, politics, and economics. We all know if you want change, of course, there's a political system. You elect who you want to vote, who's aligned with you, and those people write our laws. Right? They decide on your social security, they decide on whether or not your water is polluted, they decide on housing, they decide on fair wage, wages. There's another very powerful sector, unfortunately in our country this sector is too powerful, right? the economic sector. And when you're seeing how many workers are on strike today, it's because they're like, okay, you, the bosses cannot have so much power. We, this is wealth inequality. So that's a, a realm of change. But this sector, the culture sector, affects both, right? It affects both of those areas. And so we, we have to be able to activate in that space. And I'm gonna also show you is that, imagine that culture is like a lens. You say, I'm gonna see the world through these eyes. That's what I mean by worldview. You see it through these eyes. So I'm gonna show you now, what are some of the stats? We've been talking about television. Television, Americans watch about three to five hours of television in, in a few days, okay? Television is, and gaming are the most, and of course our phones, how people engage. Okay, the gray is how many white characters are on TV, and these other sections give you a sense of how many characters of color are on television. And as I said before, Latinos, who are almost 19%, are at 5.2. Native Americans didn't even make it. They didn't even make it to the graph, right? What does that mean about, about, about how we're experiencing? This, is, this, to me, is wild. The LGBTQ characters, in last year, there was five transgender characters. Five. On TV, like, wow. We are at a time when there is a lot of anti-trans legislation. And if you, look at, if you look at it, who is represented, right? And then women, ooh, women behind the camera. Out of 1,600 creators, you could see who are the women and who are the directors. So some of you, when you turn on the TV and you're like, wow, why is there so much sexual violence on these TV shows? This is why. This is why, because I can assure you that if you had even half, that you would be seeing something very different, right? You would be seeing things that are about mothers, about raising families. You would just be, we would be seeing a different kinds of content. And I think it's important to say this because we're also in a country that hasn't 
had good maternal health care, right? You know that women in the United States, the maternal health care they're receiving is like sub um, the rest of the world. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk to you about an example, which is marriage equality, right? How it was that gay people were able to get married in this country. And, and this is going to be uh, a, a study in why culture is powerful. So the, the bottom row here is politics and the top row is culture. So in, in 1987, so before 1987, people used to use the word homosexual, right? In a newspaper, you would read the word homosexual. And then GLAAD, this organization, said, no, please don't use that word. That's too clinical of a word. Use gay, right? That's the word you need to use. And they said, hey, Hollywood, there's no gay people on TV. Can you please make a gay character? And then Ellen happened. How many of you remember Ellen DeGeneres, her first TV show? Do you guys remember that? Okay. So Ellen DeGeneres in 1997 comes out on national television and she says, I'm gay. I don't know if you remember. And it was like, oh my God, wow. And then in the show, Ellen goes like this to her girlfriend, just like this. That's it. That's, all, that's it. And it was a whole, whole thing. So this was 1997. What had happened the year before 1997? Clinton passed the Defense of Marriage Act, that marriage was only going to be, be between a man and a woman. Okay, so I want to remind you what was happening politically, and Ellen comes out. So you can imagine, oh my God, everyone is like in a rage. What happens after that? Queer Eye, Will and Grace, right? Shows like the L word come out um, just a few years later. And if you all have seen The L Word, has anyone seen an episode of The L Word? Okay. It was no longer a, no, no, no. Culture had changed. Seriously, culture had changed. And you had The Laramie Project became one of the most popular theater plays. Laramie Project is a, is a play about a young man, Matthew Shepard, who was killed for being gay. He was dragged in a truck. And there was a play made about him that became very popular. There was a hip hop video, Macklemore made a video called Same Love. And then you had in 2013, the first athlete to come out on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You guys, it's only been 10 years since the first athlete came out as gay on the cover of Sports Illustrated. 2015, the Supreme Court passes marriage equity. So what has happened? is that culture, people began to turn on the TV and were like, oh my God, I love Will and Grace. Ellen is like such a cool person, right? You would connect with the person in the intimacy of your living room. That is the power of culture, is that you can go from, you say, I don't know any gay people, but then you see them on TV, right? Same thing with Pose. When Pose came out, you get to see transgender people on TV. Right? When Orange is the New Black comes out, you get to see people living in prison in TV, on TV. And that does something. It humanizes it so that you're like, oh, I don't, I don't have anything to be worried about. I don't have to be scared of gay people. They're, they, they're human beings. And so culture began to shift and politics was just kind of lagging behind. And so... A policy is a manifestation of an idea whose time has come. But we create those ideas in culture. And that's why it's very, very powerful. And another example, me too. This is, okay. So I have been experiencing sexual harassment for a very long time. As an artist, I can assure you it, is, it has been very normalized in artistic circles, right? I work with musicians, all that. And for a long time, I would be like, darn it. This is messed up. Why do we have to deal with this as women? Why? So in 2018, something happened, which is that Tarana Burke, who's up there, she had created the hashtag MeToo, and an actress named Alyssa Milano posted it, and it went viral, right? So in 2018, all of a sudden, we began to hear that everyone had a Me Too story. And it was everywhere. It was coming from the farm workers. It was coming from musicians, from poets. And they began to say, hey, sexual harassment is not okay. 
Sexual abuse is not okay. And in the most powerful industry in the world, you know, Hollywood shapes global narratives. They were even saying, these are powerful ladies right here. They were saying, we have a, a sexual harassment, sexual abuse problem. What happened, that was January 2018. October 2018, this is 10 months later. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford speaks in Congress. Do you all remember that moment? She spoke in Congress. We would, she would not have been able to speak in Congress had there not been a moment for people to tell their stories. This is the power of culture, you guys. Once it opens the door, the door is open. And today, every, you know, talk about culture affecting economics. I can assure you a lot of institutions had to redo their sexual harassment training, right? There are people who have lost their jobs because of that. And so I want to, this is just, to me, it's such a big win that through our storytelling, we have been able to change conditions so that young women who are entering the workforce do not have to deal with this, right? And that's powerful. And how is it that we could open the door? What the power of stories is that stories lead to other stories, right? The more that we hear around about what it's like for immigrants who are attempting to cross the border, what is it like? For them, or we hear from workers who can't even afford rent, and even though they're working two jobs, right? We, when we get to hear the stories of people who are impacted, we get to humanize them. And that's something that I really hold up in my work, right? Is how it is that through my art, I can humanize folks. And I'm gonna start sharing with you now some of my art. I've been talking to you about what are the values that hold up my work? And this is, this, this is what I teach many other artists. But now I'm going to show you some of my work and how I've done that as an artist. So I call myself an artist disruptor, right? That I'm here to disrupt narratives of oppression. And I'm here to help move so that we can change policies. I'm here to create culture that is going to change hearts and minds so that we can change policies. And some of my early, early work um, was stuff like this, right? It was very simple. This is work that I was doing in 2002. Schools, not jails, really demanding. Education was a human right. Um, because why? Because in California, my, um, my state used to be the number one incarcerator. And guess who are the majority of people incarcerated? Black and brown people, right? And so I fought against that as a young person. I also did a lot of work around urban gardens because the number one thing that kills Latino folks and black folks is food-related diseases. Why? Because we live in food deserts. So food, not just that, our gente is picking all the best stuff and not eating it. It's because that's, this is food insecurity. This is food disenfranchisement. It's not like because we don't want to. It's because the reality of what's happening in the, in the food industry is a very abusive system for workers. Right? I mean, have you seen that some of these campesinos, these food laborers, have to work out in, in extreme heat? Right? So um, my art, I would make art about planting urban gardens and the importance of that. This is some of my work around fighting racism, celebrating the um, International Day Against Racism. And I would work with unions and hospitals uh, to create artwork this piece, this is, this is a piece I did here in Arizona, right? Undocumented, unafraid. And I love this. Does anyone know this? Has, has, have you all heard of this, undocumented and afraid? Yeah, okay. So this is also, to me, such a fascinating culture change. You know, I love looking at how culture changes. So when I was growing up, my family would be like, don't go to any protests. We're, we got to be quiet. You know, we're, we're here trying to fulfill the American dream please just be quiet, right? Just please don't say nothing. And I would tell my mom, no, mama, this is not right. Let's go. And then she would have to come with me to the protest, right? Because she didn't want me to go by myself. So I remember that it was just sort of frowned upon to be politically active. And a lot of my family members were undocumented, but it was like they had to live in the shadows. And that was very normalized to say, like, just be on the down low. So when students, undocumented students, said, we are undocumented and we are unafraid, 
I was like, I was like, wow, this is very powerful. This is extremely powerful because they are naming something that was silenced for so long. And by doing it, they're breaking the stigma. They're breaking the shame. And this to me is, this is why culture is powerful. I was so inspired by them. I made art. And um, of course, what happened when these students came out? They got a win. Does anyone know what that win was? DACA. They got DACA. Obama passed the deferred action for, I forgot what, what it's, uh, child, child arrivals, chi right? So those kids, they're not kids anymore. Those young adults were able to secure the right to work and basically the right to not be deported, which honestly is not enough because those kids have families, right? We can't just care about the young people and not about their parents. So it was awesome that we, there was a win, but that does not protect these kids from long term, right? And can you imagine that every two years, you got to think about what the, pre the, the, the president in power is going to do, whether or not they're going to take away DACA. That's a very hard reality to live. And imagine this is the place where you grew up. Where are you going to go? You're going to go back to a place you've never been, right? So this, this piece was inspired here. And then the piece that I would say that is my most famous piece ever is Migration is Beautiful. And to me, this was the turning point in my career. Because I would say for the first 10 years, I was like, yeah, you know, like, let's, let's like fight the system. We're going to fight. We're going to like, you know, we're going to just, my, my posters, as you could see, were very bold. And then I learned about the monarch butterfly, the monarch butterfly, which crosses from Mexico through the United States and Canada and back, right? It has a migration pattern. And the monarch butterfly does not carry a passport. The monarch butterfly, everyone's like, yes, the monarch, we'll celebrate the monarch, we're gonna open the corridors. Even the three presidents, right? You know that the three presidents met to figure out a butterfly corridor? For the, I'm serious, for the monarca. And I always thought like, wow, why don't they do that for human beings? Like, why don't they figure out safe passage? Because you know that the data on um, women who cross the border is that 80% of them are being sexually assaulted on the way. So it's not a safe passage. Why don't we make a safe passage for people, for women, for children? Why don't we do that? Instead, you have governors putting deadly bios that cut immigrants in the water. It's really, really inhumane. So I created this and to celebrate the monarch butterfly. And also, if you could see here, there's two profiles. And that, for me, when I started studying nature, and I was like, Wow, these butterflies, it's in their DNA to remember the migration route. And these butterflies, unfortunately, are being affected by climate change. There's so much less of them. And so now, today, there's a, a worldwide campaign to save the monarcas, right? And so to me, that began the process of creating art that included nature. And I love this phrase, migration is beautiful. So I could have made a poster that said, no borders, you know, or something like that. But... Instead, I just said migration is beautiful. You know why? Because our ancestors have been migrating since the beginning of time. A lot of creatures migrate. Nature does not have borders. It really does not have borders. Why do we as human beings create these borders that actually create a lot of pain and suffering? Right? And so this one of my pieces. And then something else happened which changed my practice, which is I went from working in my little garage to working in a 4,000 square foot studio. And to me, you know, I talk about this because Harris said I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love, I, I'm an artist, but I'm also a businesswoman. And I believe that in big ideas. You know, I believe that I'm gonna go from a small space to a huge space because that's what I need for my art. That's what I needed. I manifested it in 2014 and that completely changed my practice. And in 2017, excuse me, in 2014, I also learned something which I learned how to garden. I learned how to grow my own food. And this was happening because my dad um, got cancer. And my, my dad used to be, he was like all about the plants, right? He would grow things. And I would always be like, ah, oh, I don't want to be in the garden. You know, I just, just you know, I, I would just not take an interest in growing things or being out um, spending time with nature. And when my dad started getting sick, 
um, with cancer and he just started losing his ability to, to garden, I took over his garden and I realized just the power of what it means to be in conversation with nature, in connection with nature, because as I showed you, I grew up in a city that was a lot of cement. There was hardly any trees in my neighborhood. And so, and I didn't really have a relationship to nature because my parents worked a lot. They were not able to necessarily expose me to the outdoors because they were um, busy trying to get ahead. And so when that happened, I began to create a whole nother body of work. And that is work that talks about rest because I do believe that my father worked so, so, so hard and he worked in toxic jobs and that ultimately took his life. And my parents would say to me, oh, duermes cuando te mueres. That means you sleep when you die. You got to work, Fabi. You got to work. That's why we're here. That's why we came to this country. And I would always really resent that because the fact that my parents worked so hard meant that they were not really present. My mom had to go back to work after two months of having me. And I would ask her, I'm like, how were you feeling? You had just had a cesarean. What was that like for you? She said, it was really, really hard. But that's what I had to do. And so for me, I feel like I'm the first generation who can challenge things that are part of my culture. Because I don't think it's all about like, oh yes, it's all about my cultura and I'm going to accept everything. No, I think actually the role of artists and creatives is that there are things that we have to shed. There are old ideas that we need to let go of. And we have to introduce people to new ideas, right? So just going really quickly back to Me Too, yes, we have a sexual harassment problem in this country. We do. And how are we going to begin to teach young people what is a positive, sexual, healthy culture? What does it look like? Because when I turn on TV, they're not talking about consent. They're not having conversations before they do the thing. You know what I mean? They're not. So I'm always like, okay, how are we going to show the world that we want to see? How are we going to depict it, make it real? And that's what I now do in my art, is that I don't want to just talk about what I'm against. I want to talk about what is my yes. What am I moving towards? Because, you know, as a Latina, I want to show images of Latinas resting, right? I want to share stories of Latinas being able to run million-dollar organizations and be philanthropists, because that 16 million, about six to eight of that goes right back out the door right, through, through our philanthropic arm. This piece, uh, I am healing for myself and for past generations. So another story is that <clears throat> when my mom first arrived to this country from Peru, she was involved in an unhealthy relationship. She ultimately was pregnant, and she didn't speak the language. She was in an unhealthy relationship, and the clinic that she went to encouraged her to give her firstborn up for adoption. Uh, she didn't know really fully what she was doing. She was in a crisis moment. And so my brother, my, my brother who was older than me, uh, was given up for adoption. And my mom kept that secret for 31 years. I did not know I had a brother for 31 years. And when I was 25, I get, my mom comes downstairs and she says, Favi, I have to tell you something. You have a brother. And she shows me a picture of him. And I'm like, oh my God, I have a brother. And he is hella gay. Like, I saw my brother's picture. I knew my brother was gay. I was, you know, I'm from the Bay Area. So I'm like, my brother is super gay. And I was so happy. And I asked myself, wow, my mom lived in so much shame and stigma that she was unable to share with us. And it made things made so much sense because I would always notice that. My mom carried like a, a really deep pain. And so the work that I do today is around birth justice. The work that I do today is that ensuring that moms, especially immigrant, black, native, Latina moms who face extreme medical hardship when they are having babies, do you all know that there is a maternal health crisis that is mostly, mostly affecting women of color? I fight for that because I believe that the most sacred thing is when we are bringing new life into this world and we don't need to hurry. We don't need to hurry women by pushing them to have cesareans. 
or pushing them to go back to work. We, what's up with our broken maternal health policy, right? I, I'm inspired by the stories of how my family was impacted. And so in my work, that is what I do. I talk about healing next generations. I am sharing this story with you because also so that folks understand what it is like for families to be separated. You know how my brother found me? This is super cool too. My brother found us because in 1996, when I first went into college, the World Wide Web was being born, right? The internet. And I was like, wow, what is this thing? You know, like the modem, right? I was like, whoa, what is this? And I remember in my co-op, I got a full ride to UC Berkeley, and I was living in a Chicano co-op. There was two, like, Chicano nerds that were like, hey, you want to learn how to code? And I was like, heck yeah, I want to learn how to code. So I learned how to code, and I built my first web design firm in 1999. And that's actually, I was, I was doing so good that I said, hey, I don't think I'm going to finish at UC Berkeley yet. And I started my own web business. And so I built my first website in 1999, and it was Fabiana.com. And on my website, my, my name is Fabiana Rodriguez Janoni. My mom's maiden name is Janoni. So the only thing that my brother had on the adoption certificate was the name Janoni, because my mom had already changed her name. And he, he looked it up, and he found me, and he wrote me an email, and he said, hey, I'm doing research on the Janoni family. I was like, okay, I don't know who you are. Um, and it was a weird email, right? And he was able to find my address. And when, if you see my brother and I, we're identical, super identical, except he's, he's um, a few years older. And so I always, t I think to myself, wow, the fact that I'm a storyteller and that I'm a culture maker reunited me with my brother. Because he was looking for us for many, many years. And he finally found us in 2001. And so in my work, I talk about this. I talk about what it means to heal for different generations. Um, this is the uh, piece that I did during COVID. Collective care is our best protection. And I'm going to show a few more. I know we're, we're running a, a short on time, but... I want to just show my craft with you, not just my organizing, but my craft. Listen to your body. This thing has been such a hard thing for me to learn because like, just like my mama, I was like, okay, mom, I'm going to be number one in school. And I was number one. I was like head of the student class. I got elected student president. I had like a 4.2 GPA. Like, I feel like my parents' extreme worth ethic kind of translated to me. Um, and so there's not, it's not all bad parts, there's good parts, and today as an adult, I still deal with this. I still think about how do I listen to my own body so I can be tuned in and not just work, 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 and, and, and allow my body to rest. My body, my decisions. And, you know, now I'm moving into some of my public art. Uh, so... Because I did not um, take art classes in high school, I was not able to go to art school, right? I was engineering and architecture because my parents were like, math, science. You know, I had math tutor after school, science camp on Saturdays, summer STEM camp, you know, and, and art was something I would have to do after all of that. Uh, and so I remember going, I really wanted to go to art college and I remember saying, okay, let me just try. And I would go to places like New York where they have Cooper Union. Cooper Union is a free art school. Because unfortunately, art schools are among the, the, the most expensive schools of all the schools. Art schools are very expensive. And I would take my art, and I just wouldn't get accepted. So I became an artist largely on my own, through my own path. And um, a lot of the opportunities that I've had as an artist is because I had to pave my way. And so for me to be able to make large-scale art like this is like, is, is for me, I'm, sometimes I'm just like surprised myself. I'm like, wow, how did I go from making these little prints in my garage to doing things for kids? So this is uh, a mural that I did at Markham Elementary, which is a neighborhood in Oakland that has the least trees. It has a 10-block radius with very, very few trees. And so the fund for public land came and they said, we're going to plant 100 trees and we want you to create a mural about the kids' relationship to trees and how they feel. And so this is a piece that I did. It's a huge basketball court. 
and the um, project Ancestral Futurism uh, that um, Leticia was talking about earlier. This is a picture of it. So I work with the National Parks, the Presidio, to help identify what are the creatures that were living in California pre-colonization, right? Because you know the gold rush happened and you saw the extinction of the bears, of the otters, right? Massive, massive ecological destruction happened. And so I worked with local tribes and with the park to think about how we could elevate those stories so that people could say, oh, is there bears here? No, but there used to be, and this is their story. Is there salmon here? No, because the dams that are getting built are affecting the salmon, and this is what you can do about it. Um, pool, I did a pool, the Garfield Public Pool in uh, the Barrio in the Mision um, about children and their relationship to water, right? And how important it is that young people have outdoor experiences. Uh, and in closing, I want to show you some of the art that I've been doing just this year. The redwoods, right? So I get to live in the Bay Area where we have the redwoods. Something fascinating about these trees, the redwoods, the redwoods are the tallest trees in the world. Did you know that they don't have tap roots? Their roots extend and they hold each other up. And to me, this is the ultimate sign of interconnectedness, that the trees that are the tallest in the world can grow tall because their roots support each other. And they create circles of support um, in order for them to get very tall. I've been doing a lot of art about freedom, about transformation, and, of course, about the creatures in the desert. And one of the reasons I, I really love these creatures is because I think a lot of times people think the desert and they think, oh, what's in the desert, right? There's this perception of the desert. And similarly, you know, being from California, I think when people think of the border, they have a very kind of like idea or image in their head that's just about the wall. And it's really sad because that wall actually has not really solved things. On the contrary, it's led to death and destruction and ecological impacts. And um, every single president since Clinton has been just throwing money at that. And can you imagine, like, what if there was a different narrative? What if the border was like, hey, the border is where you go to experience the ex exchange of cultures? The border is not, the border is not hard, it's porous. Let's exchange culture and community and food. Like, imagine that. Imagine if there could be beautiful like festivals at the border that celebrated the unique ecological beauty that this is. And that to me is the power of culture is that we can achieve that. We can move towards stories like that. Um, in fact, I know that um, the, uh, Kimmy, who I think is here, we've been collaborating on doing a whole initiative funded by the Ford Foundation that's about border narratives around how we can change hearts and minds to tell a different story. And so in closing, I'll show these creatures. So this is the Gamble's quail, the roadrunner, which I finally got to see. I mean, you all are so used to seeing these creatures. I finally got to see uh, the roadrunner, the jaguar, which has actually literally been impacted by the border wall because it's affected its ability to migrate, and uh, the Sonoran toad. Um, there's three others, but this one is, is especially unique because uh, one of our friends here at the University of Arizona, Robert Villa, has been doing research on this because in this whole psychedelic boom that's happening around this country, people think they're going to get high off this toad. And they are affecting the population of toads, of the Sonoran toad, because people are, are capturing them in order to try to extract their medicine, and it's created a... Uh, a bit of ecological impacts. And so there is somebody here at the university who is writing about that. And so I definitely wanted to include um, and celebrate the Sonoran toad. So thank you everyone. And as, a, as closing, what I, what I wanna say is to remember that like culture is like the ocean. It surrounds us all the time. It is in movement. And sometimes there is a wave that changes culture forever. But in order for that wave to happen, we have to create the conditions for change. We have to tell our stories. We have to be fearless about sharing our stories because when we share our stories, we shed shame, we shed stigma, and we open the door for other people to share stories. 
And so remember, as culture is like the ocean, it shapes us and we shape it. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, wow. <laughs> um, I'm moved and, you know, full of gratitude for this talk. Uh, we did have some time uh, for questions. I thought I was, I think I was supposed to ask the first one, but um, I didn't write one down. And people who know me know that that's actually quite not on brand. I always have <laughs> questions. Um, but we are passing around some cards. Um, so if folks have any questions, but I can also take a couple um, if, if anyone has a burning question um, that's, that's emerging right now from, from just receiving um, this talk. Yes, Leticia. Um, hi, Fabiana. Um, so, like, going forward with your art. One second, let me give you the mic. I just had you in my class. Um, hi. Going forward with your art, what would you say like your bet, your next step is? So like whether it be like in artwork or like another movement that you want to focus on? Yes, I love that question. And I'm going to be going into film and television because I just, I, thank you. First, that is the fastest way to reach people. And when I see the stories about Latinas, not just that, these shows keep getting cut. It's like one day we have Hentified and then it's cut. We have Vida and it's cut. So I am going to go into that space because I think that, you know, I've, I tell stories visually and motion picture is literally that. It is a picture in motion. Um, and I feel like there, I have very powerful stories. I actually want to create a story about uh, how my brother found us and, and, and just create a story around how we can um, think about families uh, in a different way. So, yes, film and TV. Um, and I think we're just going to collect some questions. Do you have? Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much. It's beautiful. Um, you mentioned earlier about gender justice and some of the work that you do. Could you go a little bit more into that? Yeah, I, mean, I totally. feel like I see it when I look at it. Yeah. But I'd love to hear a little more about that. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I uh, grew up experiencing many things because of my body. Um, uh, I am in a femme body. And so I experienced, since I was little, um, many things that I realized are not okay, whether it's, you know, there was not a lot of narratives around, like, strong girls who looked like me. There was definitely not a lot of role models in the culture around me. And so, and not just that, is that it was always about, you know, being a princess or looking really cute or just, you know, these narratives. I mean, also, I was watching telenovelas, so wow, what that does to your imagination, right? Watching these things that you are only valuable if you um, have some kind of, you know, Prince Charming. So, um, I, for me, gender justice, what it means is that we, I want to create a world where all genders can exist and that we can be fully expressed in our power, in our joy, and not fear the consequences of what it means to be um, harassed, violated, abused, invisibilized, or made into a caricature. Because that's a big disservice, y'all. It's a huge disservice. You know, it, if you look at who is setting the trends, like cultural trends, you know who's setting them? Girls. What girls like becomes the trend. Okay? So girls are like really sharp. And yet, we live in a world where today, these girls are hurting themselves because of this, right? They're being marketed to in a way that affects their self-esteem. Um, we, I, I wanna live in the world where young girls could grow up and feel like they can do anything that they set their mind to. And in order to do that, we have to have a world that is just for all genders. Because I also think, I, I don't believe in the gender binary. I don't believe that it's just man, woman. I believe we live in a spectrum and that people should express themselves and these boys as well. We don't need to be, you know, creating a culture where these boys don't have tools to communicate their emotions. And so I want to see stories of more soft masculines on television. I want to see healthy depictions of masculinity. And I really wish there was a movement around that 
Um, and also by gender justice, I mean that we all deserve the, the correct health care, right? We deserve, deserve health care that affirms our gender, that supports us in making choices around whether or not to have a family. Um, we deserve to get paid the same. I could tell you Latinas make around, what, $53? 53 cents to every dollar that a white man makes? Did you guys know? The Latina pay disparity, it's bad. Black women also have a pay disparity, right? So gender equity means also pay me the same, equality. Uh, that's what I strive for. Um, and it's why in my work, I try to always uh, include like, you know, just stories that will help inspire people who don't always see themselves represented. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. Um, this one um, says, how do you ensure the durability of your work? Or is it all temporary? Yeah. Uh, no, my work is not all temporary. The ones I showed you, uh, two of those are permanent. Uh, and I am doing more and more permanent. Uh, and I don't mind the temporary. I actually think something really interesting happens. Uh, so at the park where I installed this same temporary sticker, it's called Illuminographics. When I installed it at the Presidio National Park, it was up for six months, and the staff did not want it removed. They said, absolutely not. They said, the kids play on this. The classrooms come, because the kids literally would like jump on it. And so it became a secondary playground for them. And then people would come to the field station and say, hey, why is... What is that dog out there? They're like, oh, that's not a dog, that's a coyote. What is that coyote doing there? And they're like, well, we have a fact sheet for you that talks about how coyotes are coming back to San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. So it created a whole kind of um, moment. And I know that you know, even here at the Poetry Center, you're going to notice people interacting with the built environment in a different way. And so I really love the fact that temporary art brings out all of these feelings right, that we can then say like, oh wow, color does this. I mean, think, look, look at the color. Color makes you feel certain ways. Uh, and so I don't mind temporary because it just allows us to, to learn new things about how we engage with art. Um, thank you. I'm gonna combine these two questions because um, they're kind of about um, shift and change in your work and the time also shifting and changing. Um, this one is what have you learned and noticed about the effectiveness of your more confrontational work versus your more evocative or poetic work? And kind of added to that this question about movements and strategies for organizing must change over time. And how, so how do you feel um, that art for social change is shifting due to this specific moment, moment of technology, social media, the edges of fascism, and the falling off of empire? So I kind of put yeah. them together because I think they're sort of related. Yeah. I'm an artist, and I embrace the spectrum of emotions. I don't have one way of doing things. I like my bold in your face. You'll see some of my posters. There's some of them are like in your face, right? Like when I'm talking about my bodily autonomy, I will be in your face about it. But, you know, when I'm talking about hugging a tree, it's going to be very different. It's going to feel different. And I think that we need to embrace that there's a spectrum of emotions and sometimes you're gonna feel rage, sometimes you're gonna feel joy, sometimes you're gonna feel a deep connection and we need that. And that's what artists can do, that's what we're good at. We're actually able to impact all of the emotions. And I would say, what is the role um, of art at, a, at, at times of planetary crisis? I think we need art more than ever now because we need to show a future of possibility. We need to show what the world can look like when we are no longer in an abusive relationship with nature. If we continue using fossil fuels, we are going, we, we're going to create a hell on earth, right? You know that the largest illegal industry, the second largest illegal industry today, I think the number one is guns. Number two is sexual trafficking. So that is a gender justice problem. We have a problem when the largest illegal economy in the world is the trafficking of human beings, overwhelmingly women and children, right? So we need to address that through narratives, narrative change. Um, we have to address the wealth inequality gap. There, it, it is crazy to me that you have the richest people in the world and you have wealth disparities where people cannot even afford 
to live in a, in a home anymore, even with two jobs. And so in these moments, I think we need the stories. We need to demand that what you're seeing on TV reflects your values. We have to move away from just being consumers to demanding that we also get the kind of content and movies and books that our libraries carry the books that we are engaging with culture that is aligned with our values. We, we don't just need to be entertained. We need culture that's going to help us move towards the deep, deep collaboration and changes that are gonna be needed over the next few decades, right? And, and you know, the IPCC, the international body on climate change says that we have six years. We have six years to alter the course of global warming. So I think that, imagine, imagine if the president created a federal program on getting artists to work on climate solutions. Y'all, let's make these EVs cool. Make solar power cool. Let's educate folks. I think there's so much that can be done and we need kind of bold leadership on it. Um, it makes me think a lot about what you just said about we don't need to be entertained and how so much, even this past two weeks, I've had the most fun you know, of just being yeah. with you because yes. I, at the same time, I feel like what you're doing is also creating a different way of thinking about joy in mm -hmm. our consumption of culture by being co-producers. So I'm going to end with these two questions. They're, I'm gonna, also going to put them together okay. because I think they're kind of complementary in, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. One of them says, I am a storyteller and I am weary. Mm -hmm. What do you do to find inspiration after discouragement? And follow-up question, what do you do when your listeners have short attention spans and no longer care? So that's one, one question. But I thought I'd pair it with this one that says, I teach at Utterback Middle School um, here in Tucson, marginalized brown and black kiddos. We have kids um, dying from gangs, et cetera. Will you please, please, por favor, present at our career day? Um, our kids need your inspiration, um, who are wonderful. Uh, sorry, I can't read this, Grace, um, performing arts school uh, to, to thrive in South, the city of South Tucson. Yeah. So I just thought there were kind of two, yeah. kind of part of the same yeah. sort of thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I engage with very heavy realities um, in my work, and I'm so grateful that I could be an artist because that helps me move the grief. It helps me... Think about what I can do to elevate the stories that we are not seeing, right? And so I do think, I mean, it's, 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 the, it's really tough right now. And, and, and I also think that just the combination of everything that's happening in our world, it's a very tough time. And I think that creativity and being able to both create stories or uplift stories or to use the power of culture is also very healing because we need to move towards solutions. We need to move towards humanization, right? And um, I think that, yeah, for me, how I process a lot of things is I, I, I get creative about it, or I try to say, let me make a piece of art um, about this. Let me work with artists. Let me educate myself, read some books by amazing authors, watch some good documentaries, learn come from a place of learning so that then I can create. And so I would encourage, you know, storytellers that if you are feel, feel, feeling weary, um, to read other people, look at other people's work that inspires you. And, and, and um, I think that when you read personal stories of people, there's something that it does to move your heart. Um, so, yes. Um, and so, yeah. with that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, uh, Dr. Harris Kornstein, to close us up this evening, I just want to say thank you again. Thank to you, Fabiana. A round of applause for you. Thank you, generosity. Tucson. You guys are so great. Thank you. Wonderful. So, thank you again to Fabiana for being here, and thank you to you all for being here, and especially many of you who have participated throughout this past week of activities with us. Uh, and again, I encourage you to take a look at desertsymphony.arizona.edu. Uh, there might be some more spots left for our workshop on Thursday. Otherwise, uh, let's enjoy this beautiful installation, Desert Symphony, and some wonderful food, uh, and have a chance to keep and making my posters over here. collaborations. Anyone... Oh, and uh, Favana also has some posters for sale. They're vintage, uh, though. They're, they're like 10 years old. These are, these are, this is the vintage <laughs> Favi as well. You can get some of your migration as beautiful stickers. Oh, yeah. Um, and again, don't forget to pick up one of our commemorative stickers 
uh, for Desert Symphony as well. So let's give one more round of applause to Fabiana Rodriguez. Thank you, everybody. Real honor to be here. Thank you.